Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How Drupal 8 Reaches Its Full Potential on Pantheon. Your speakers for today are Pantheon co-founders and Drupal wizards, David Strauss and Matt Cheney. Just a few housekeeping items to go over before we start. Please make sure you submit any questions you have during the presentation in the question window. We will answer as many of the questions as we can during the Q&A portion of today's presentation. Also, this webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be made available to everyone next week. I'd now like to turn it over to Matt. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Drupal 8, the future of Drupal webinar. My name is Matt Cheney, and today is a very special webinar because for Drupal 8, it is all happening. We've had a, like, a long four years of getting this ready. We've had a lot of anticipation, a lot of conversation, a lot of hard work. But as some of you may have seen, there will be a release of Drupal 8 in just about two weeks on November 19th. This will be the official 8.0.0 release, which means all the critical issues will be resolved, all the security issues will be resolved, and Drupal 8 will be ready for all the beautiful people of the world to start developing websites and building uh, the sites of their dreams. Here at Pantheon, we're you know, geared up as your favorite platform for development and hosting of all Drupal and WordPress sites to support Drupal 8 formally. Uh, we have our support team trained to answer questions. We have some really great features in the product and support for how Drupal 8 works that David will be talking about later and we'll allow folks to spin up a Drupal 8 site on the platform and really get rolling. And that's something that I'll be showing you today. We also have a really cool Drupal 8 portal with a bunch of resources and information that you can also check out on our, on our website. And then, of course, there'll be some parties. When the release party happens, they'll be all across the world, you know, people coming together to celebrate Drupal 8, talk about what they're going to use Drupal 8 for, talk about their, how they've worked on it, and generally you know, celebrate the most important release in Drupal's history. So check that out on groups.drupal.org, same day as the release. And I think sort of as part of this webinar, I think I sort of want to throw out a little bit of a, a throat clearing here because we do get to party for this release. It is going to be really awesome, but it's been a long sort of strange road to get here. And I'm not making a, some sort of like sort of Grateful Dead illusion with respect to this, but I'm saying that the last five years have been really hard. We've rewritten the Drupal content management system to support a whole new set of, of modern development practices. We've had tens of thousands of hours of very accomplished and smart people working in the issue queues, working on code to build and develop this software. And we've had a lot of politics and a lot of drama and a lot of just getting it all done to get us there. And I think that like that's part of how open source software works. That's part of a community pseudo consensus driven process and what that means. And I think as a community we made it together that we had a lot of people, over 3,200 individual contributors, work on the code of Drupal 8 alone, as well as many more as part of conversations and dialogues with people who are using Drupal. This is a shot of the group picture from DrupalCon LA of a, a lot of those contributors coming together to make this release happen. And it couldn't happen soon enough. So we need to celebrate. This is the biggest release of Drupal ever. And sort of take it from David and I, we've seen a few of these things. It's been four and a half years of development and thinking about sort of what's happening with the new software. 3,200 and counting contributors to the core system with, again, many more as part of the dialogue around it and many more who will work in the contrib space around Drupal 8. And we're talking about 200 plus new features and improvements to the system that will allow developers, end users, site owners, and everyone in the ecosystem to really have a lot of fun. So let's throw a little bit of hip hip hooray for Drupal 8. <laughs> and I think it's important sort of to also underscore that Drupal 8 is the future of Drupal. And with it, to some extent, the, the future of, of web development and sort of complex CMSs. That when Drupal 7 came out in sort of 2011, the web was really different. We didn't have things like AngularJS to do a sort of decoupled uh, architecture. We didn't have as many mobile devices. We didn't have a whole lot of things that people take for granted on the web today. And that a lot of the planning and the development of Drupal 8 was about making sure that we've developed tools to take advantage 
of not only the technologies that have been developed since then, but technologies that will happen in the future. But the web is growing at a particularly fast way rate. A lot of people and organizations are getting online, are publishing their information online, and they're looking for ways to really get that message out there. And that Drupal 8 is going to be the standard for that. So I hope you're excited, as excited as I am. Um, but I think sort of to, to put in context what we're doing at Drupal 8, and this is really important to me personally, and I think it's important in terms of larger sort of Drupal project, of which I've basically spent my entire, Dave and I both, our entire adult lives working on this, that there was this dream, a uh, dream that I don't think exists at the moment, but there is this dream that Drupal would be for every single person. This is a slide from Dries' keynote, DrupalCon in Paris, Ori Peckelman's DrupalCon Paris, where we would have Drupal be the place we wanted to be, the richest feature set with for the most people as a CMS. And this is a good message. It's something that I personally find a lot of value in, that I like to be part of something big. I like to have a, the idea that Drupal could run double digits percentages of the internet and that it could be a sort of, a sort of tool for everyone. And Drupal 7, I think, was in some ways an attempt to do that in 2011. This is the landing page from this when it happened. Uh, for those who were around the community in 2011 for Drupal 7, there was a lot of cool new features that came out in, in that product. There was a, a site called Drupal Gardens that was sort of trying to be a Dru easy to spin up Drupal for everyone. Companies like ours at Pantheon were sort of getting rolling, helping you ride development and hosting tooling for people. And that, you know, you had really big sites, examiner.com launched in Drupal 7, and you had a lot of promise sort of in that open internet to sort of build really awesome sites. And there was a lot of feeling that Drupal was about 2% of the internet then, and we could really sort of, sort of ramp up. The reality is this is a graph of, of adoption of, of Drupal. Drupal stayed at about 2% since, since that launch. And that's not necessarily bad. In real terms, the internet's growing very quickly. So maintaining a 2% sort of, sort of presence is actually really, really awesome. There's new Drupal sites coming online every day. But as again, since 2011, the web has changed a lot. And that the kinds of things that maybe everyone would need are not necessarily what Drupal can provide. Because there's a lot of competition for technologies to make websites that for folks who have, have played around with Wix or Squarespace, or at least seen their Super Bowl commercials, you um, have uh, you know, a really easy drag and drop way to create a simple website. And for folks who are just looking to put up a couple pages and a picture, it might make more sense to go towards one of those solutions. They're not particularly complex. They can't do a lot beyond what they do out of the box, but they're you know, increasingly becoming a part of the web ecosystem. And other SaaS services like Facebook and Yelp are providing ways for people to have online profiles or restaurants or businesses to have their own internet profiles that are pretty feature rich and definitely help you know sort of get the word out and why do you need your own you know uh, you know restaurant for your establishment or website for your establishment if you have a cool Yelp page that this is eating away at some of the sort of the, the, the room that Drupal could have grown the other place is that uh, I think sort of Dave and I have had the privilege of working in the WordPress community for the last year, year and a half or so. At Pantheon, we support both Drupal and WordPress, both open source content management systems, of course. And WordPress has been killing it for the sort of, you know, general use case. As of, you know, today-ish, you've got 24.8% of all the websites on the internet running WordPress. And there's a lot of good reasons for this. WordPress has a great WYSIWYG out of the box, media management, easy to spin up on WordPress.com, as well as a lot of power features that you can do really complex things with WordPress. You can build out, you know, some more complex pages. You can run it in a decoupled architecture mode. I'm actually giving a talk at WordPress uh, conference in, in Philadelphia about how to do this. And you're, uh, you know, really seeing a lot of people jump on, on the WordPress bandwagon. Um, and that, that didn't mean that Drupal became sort of everything for the internet, but it did mean that Drupal found this really awesome niche of being the kind of thing, here's a market position sort of slide, where you know, to the right you have sort of used by many sites, and then on the top you have sort of high traffic, or we can proxy that for complex sites. That Drupal's been this really good tool for building complex sites. That a lot of the projects that, I, that we all work on collectively are, are bigger projects. They have development teams. They have a lot of programming. And, um, and work that goes into them. And that's an important role to fill in the ecosystem. So I would say that like on one hand, 
Drupal's greatest challenge is that it is, it's, it's a set of power tools. It's for professional developers building complex sites with you know, substantial budgets to get them done. That, and that's difficult because that's not for everyone. But on the same time, it's also Drupal's greatest opportunity. That having the ability to have a tool that's for power use cases that can build stuff under the hood to make things really great and can provide a lot of that foundation uh, is something that will allow us to build a really free and open web. Because in the world of content management systems, there's a spectrum of what sort of our world needs. We need some small sites, blogs, personal websites, things that are quick and easy to set up, have some good admin, but like can more or less get done. But we also need more complex things that can integrate with external services that can be highly performant and scalable for millions of users and can accomplish pretty much any kind of feature we want. And in the world of sort of the really big websites, there's this, this thing called web content management where you have you know, some proprietary solutions like Adobe's product and Sitecore that are trying to provide those, those proprietary options. And I think there's a belief sort of in the, in the Drupal community that Drupal can be moving more in that direction for those bigger projects. And I think that's good because open source software is, free and open source software is important. It's, it's winning on the web. It's, it's, it's approaching 26, 27% of uh, almost 30% of all websites. It's important for how we organize our technical work and how we expand stuff in the future. And I think as web developers, we want to sort of emphasize that Drupal 8 is just one tool in your box to develop websites for your customers in the future. We still have Drupal 7. It still will work really well. There's a fork of Drupal 7 backdrop that's trying to extend some of Drupal 7's functionality by adding things from Drupal 8, like WYSIWYG configuration management. We still have WordPress for those kind of projects. But that Drupal 8 can be one of the many ways that we can make a better web for everyone. We can have the right tools to job. And a lot of this webinar is trying to talk about the features of Drupal 8, why you really like it. We're going to show you how it works, do a quick install, and then talk about sort of some stuff on Pantheon that makes it really great. So I'll turn it over to David to talk about uh, sort of the philosophy behind Drupal 8 and sort of what it, what it is. <laughs> So uh, in many ways, Drupal 8 is the most complete CMS that we've ever delivered uh, in terms of the out-of-the-box functionality that you're getting. You're getting WYSIWYG. You're getting views and core. Drupal 7 uh, was already moving that ball forward by putting uh, fields in core uh, and providing um, uh, better integration with the database layer. Um, in a lot of cases, you can build a site uh, on Drupal 8 by configuring your way to a site and then only working at the front end layer. And that front end layer is the friendliest layer ever with uh, Twig. Um, so to go into some of the details, um, the, uh, the best part, in my opinion, of what Drupal 8 has done is it's embraced Pi, which is proudly invented elsewhere. It is the opposite of not invented here syndrome, which uh, we had pretty well established as a community for most of our releases up to 7. Uh, what this means is that if someone else is doing a project that is related to Drupal, compatible with it in, say, PHP, deliverable with a packaging like Composer or Symfony, we can integrate that functionality into our project, uh, be able to leverage uh, contributions that they are getting and improvements they are making without us having to make them. And probably the most important part uh, of Pi is that we're going to be familiar to people who are coming from outside the Drupal community. Um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, for every con for every change that we have to embrace as a community and relearn as developers on Drupal, uh, people are uh, who are coming from outside Drupal are going to find it all the more familiar with the tools. And one of those big foundations is that we're now built on Symfony, which is one of the most popular frameworks for PHP. This means people who are PHP developers, not just Drupal developers, are going to be able to leverage what we do in our project, <clears throat> make contributions that can be improving Drupal sites, uh, and understand how our framework works without it being uh, filled with kind of Drupalisms that people have to figure out. And one thing I would add, I think, that's really nice to see is that I feel sort of on the web we're experiencing a sort of PHP renaissance, that when sort of both of David and I started doing a lot, of, a lot of this sort of web development. PHP had a sort of bad rap. It hadn't been, it, it was being updated, but it wasn't getting a ton of new features. It was sort of seen as web trash, and it wasn't really, you know, killing it in that space. But in the last few years, through the projects like Symphony 
And with new releases of PHP 5 all the way to PHP 7, we have a lot of new features that things like Drupal can take advantage of. And I think that's one of the reasons why PHP runs 80% of the web is because it's increasingly building the features that people need to build to build the internet. PHP 7 is going to be a serious challenger to Node.js, in my opinion, because it is just going to be offering a runtime that offers most of the benefits in terms of performance, uh, but with a language that is just easier to work with. And with all the improvements that have happened through PHP 5 up to 7, uh, honestly, a language that's easier to code in and easier to maintain projects and than, uh, than Node.js. Um, it's also composer friendly, <clears throat> which is uh, dealing with the greater PHP community well beyond what Symfony is. Um, composer is kind of the new generation of build systems for PHP. Uh, and Drupal 7, or Drupal 8 is going to be shipping with, out of the box with composer friendly metadata so that when you want to integrate additional composer elements, when you want to integrate Drupal into a larger composer project, uh, it, it's going to be there for you. If you love Drush Make, you'll love Composer. Yeah, it's it is like Drush Make taken to the nth degree in terms of um, better build systems, uh, better uh, kind of community project libraries, so that people can ship their code uh, and make it available through Composer without necessarily having to just go through, say, Drupal.org. Um, another thing uh, is that. We're much more object-oriented and namespaced, uh, which when it's done right, and I think that a lot of it is done right in Drupal 8, um, it's about hiding functionality and complexity that you don't need to deal with on a constant basis. Um, you can see kind of this control panel here where when the panel is down, you see the essential buttons, and then when you lift it up, you basically get all the detailed functionality, and that's what a lot of um, this is doing here, where before we were kind of using conventions, but you had to look at the entire control panel and we kind of highlighted a few buttons on it. Uh, now we have, we're taking advantage of language and framework level support for enforcing this and having good development practices. It also means that all this complexity uh, is digestible by things like, um, uh, like integrated development environments that can parse all this data and show you what interfaces you're actually working with without you having to read through it and read through coding standards. Um, and uh, we're also taking migrate to upgrade as part of core now. Um, this has actually long been the practice all the way back to Drupal 4, uh, 4 point X releases through 5 through 6 for the biggest sites because let's be honest, the in place upgrade was rarely uh, safe to do, um, especially if it was done over the web. Uh, and now that we're doing the migrate to upgrade, uh, we're doing the same sort of manipulation of the content moving from old sites to new sites as the professionals have long done. So we're kind of putting power tools in the hands of every user. But uh, Drupal 8 doesn't just have better tools for doing the front-end development with things like Twig. Uh, we're also including things like REST.module and Core, which is sort of a gateway to including all sorts of other front-end um, novel ways of working with data and information. Everything from using Drupal as a mobile application backend for, for say, a native app on Android or iPhone, uh, to building headless Drupal so you can use whatever front-end toolkit that you want. Uh, so whether you're building the front-end in Drupal or building the front-end outside of Drupal, Drupal 8 is offering really neat tools. There are also lots of performance improvements to Drupal Core, uh, where before we had a monolithic bootstrap where we went through a lot of work um, and spent a lot of time initializing things before you would have any usable way to deliver a web request. Uh, in Drupal 7 and earlier, you had pretty much three choices. Uh, you could either do a full bootstrap and have the full APIs of Drupal available. You could kind of end the bootstrap early uh, by doing some of the early kind of boot hooks uh, for Drupal, which you would only have access to a fraction of the API then. Or you could ship just a raw PHP file if you really needed to get the best in performance. But with uh, the capabilities of dynamic class loading combined with the URL routing uh, that Symfony offers with the core that we've included there, um, you, there's no longer a reason to have uh, only a handful of finite choices of how much you want to load before you are able to handle the request. Um, the, the capabilities that you need will dynamically load as you uh, access them. So the fewer things that you use, the quicker that your request will be. And it's less a case of where you put it in the bootstrap uh, or in the process of delivering a page and more about minimizing dependence on resources. 
Drupal 8 also has massively improved caching. Um, up to Drupal 7, what was happening is um, typically a cache key could only get generated after you had done most of the work for generating the item because it was typically some sort of hash or um, generation based on the pre-processed data. So really the only thing you could skip uh, was uh, the HTML rendering of the data that you would harvest out of the database uh, for individual elements on the page. Drupal 8 changes all of that and it changes it in two ways. Uh, first of all, it more explicitly maps um, what the keying of an individual item is, which means that we can determine whether we can hit the cache really quickly, uh, much faster than we can in Drupal 7. And because there are elements like a serialization, the permissions array, plus the URL, um, as uh, seen in this example here, um, it's, it's actually intelligible to systems outside of Drupal, like Varnish, uh, which means that we actually have a fresh I mean, like, it's always been kind of a, a promised land of doing ESI with Drupal where you could ha integrate individual elements at the edge uh, or in a CDN, and Drupal 8 actually makes that reasonably viable without tons of custom work because, it, uh, because the caching system is actually centric around how that sort of element gets indexed at the edge. Plus, uh, uh, we'd like to show Mr. Applebaum here, um, who has nothing to do with the Drupal project, but um, is uh, an awesome security researcher um, and uh, has lots of interesting projects that he works on. <laughs> the and I think, yeah, and, and sort of an under, and to underscore sort of the, a lot of the security improvements that have happened in Drupal 8. I mean, one of the great things about the Drupal project is that we have a security team that will sort of maintain and improve the core, core system. And I think sort of new in the Drupal 8 cycle is a bug bounty program that'll sort of for the next few months, if you find a security issue in Drupal 8, you can report it to the Drupal community. They'll go through responsible disclosure and provide some financial incentive to help with that, mm -hmm. as well as all this community love you get for helping with that kind of stuff. Um, but in Drupal 8 itself, uh, I'd say the biggest improvements are security by default. Uh, where we're building on, say, not only the database abstraction layer of Drupal 7, which made it much harder to do SQL injections. We're taking that security approach all the way to the front end where with the Twig template system, it's secure by default. Uh, if you're including an element on the page, unless you go out of your way to not escape it for safety on the page, it's going to get escaped. So uh, if you just include elements on there, um, they will get taken care of. And instead of running into a security flaw where you're surprised that you're not escaping something, what's more likely to happen is you'll find that you're escaping some things that you didn't intend to, and then you can figure out exactly what, uh, how to fix that. So it becomes a bug in some circumstances, usually for layout, rather than an actual security vulnerability. <coughs> One of the biggest things I had my hand in uh, is configuration management for Drupal 8, which uh, finally takes the foundations of a configuration layer and allows it to be embedded in the code and travel with the project. Because part of Drupal 8 being the most complete CMS that Drupal has ever been is that you can configure your way to a lot of capabilities that required code before, uh, which means that managing that configuration is more important than ever, especially because you can have code that depends on configuration, configuration that depends on code. If you ship code that that um, delivers a field. You want to be able to have that field be configured on certain, say, content types on the site. Uh, if you have a view that, that requires uh, that certain themes be available in the code, then you want that theme and that view to ship uh, exactly at the same time, to get tested at the same time. Um, and this really lives that, um, I think it really delivers on that. Um, and it delivers on the way that is um, simple for simple things and possible for complex things, where if you're a module developer, it's extremely easy to use. Uh, it's barely different than using variable set and variable get for the basic use cases. Uh, and for more complex use cases, like making schema changes on configuration, it's now actually possible to identify that new configuration is being vacuumed up and respond to it. And not in the sort of ad hoc way that features did by kind of bolting on that configuration management but as a core part of authoring modules. Yeah, and this is both of our favorite features in Drupal 8, and we'll be showing a demo of how this works later. And uh, ending back to Matt. Um, sort of more on the sort of front end and the sort of end user experience, one of, I think, the really awesome things that happened really early in the Drupal 8 
update cycle was the move to take the views module, which is one of the most popular and useful modules in Drupal, and put it into Drupal core. And this was actually a whole lot of work. This wasn't just like take the contrib project and commit it to the, the core branch. This was about taking views and rewriting a, a lot of it to fit more into the Drupal sort of core sort of process, as well as modifying Drupal core screens, like the administration content screen and mid co uh, file screen to use, um, to use views by default. And then I think this, from a sort of adoption standpoint, could be really awesome because Previously, if you insta installed Drupal off Drupal.org as a new user, you really had to figure out that you also needed views to do something interesting with your website. And that sort of, that was a blocker for certain people, created some frustration. Having views in core allows people who just get Drupal for the first time to have a more complete content management system and have that views module already installed and natively supported by all of the different components of Drupal. Yep. Um, and sort of much like that, uh, the other feature that I think is really awesome is that a lot of uh, additional field types, things, um, things like having a reference to another content item or a, a, a URL link or a, a date field or an email field or a telephone, are really important types of data that you would want to store as those things in, the content, in your content management system. Those all previously took their own modules that you would have to get to make them work. You would need to get entity underscore reference. You would need to get link. You would need to get date API. You would need to get email. You get all of these different things bundled in. And not everybody found those modules. People would abuse the text field to sort of work for these different things. But that by bundling them in core, there's a standard way this data will be stored and validated. And it will create a situation where you can just just with Drupal core, you can do a whole lot. It also means that the more that things like views are embedded in core, the more that fields are embedded in core, the more reliable updates will be between Drupal versions. So the prospects for updates to Drupal 9 are much better than even just prospects from 7 to 8, just because the more that's standardized across sites, the more reliable that update process can be. And I think that's really important, because the, the thing I don't want people to lose sight in is that Drupal at its core is a content management system. I mean, it can do other stuff, but it's, it, its real value, its core value is taking your data and your information, storing it in a meaningful way, and then being able to output it to a website, to a mobile app, to whatever kind of, of process you want. And having more capacity to store content and display content with fields and views is a really, really big deal. For unstructured data, uh, one of the really awesome things that Drupal 8 is going to be including uh, is a WYSIWYG in, in the core distribution. That uh, This is one of the things when I wake up somewhere awesome January 1st, 2016, I'm going to be happy that my favorite content management system has a WYSIWYG that ships with it. Um, it's to some extent a little embarrassing that if you download Drupal now, you don't have a WYSIWYG. And for those who have installed the WYSIWYG in Drupal, it's actually really hard to do. It takes a number of different modules to get going. You have to pick which WYSIWYG will work. And especially from a security perspective, it's actually really difficult to get right. That, you know, in a, to prevent against cross-site scripting and other kinds of exploits, you really want to have a very one-to-one -one relationship with the buttons that exist on the WYSIWYG and the kinds of markup that the, the system will display to users. In Drupal 7, you have to do a lot of configuration and use different modules to make that real. In Drupal 8, it's a really clean process. We have one WYSIWYG, it's a tiny MC. WYSIWYG. It has a set of buttons that ships by default. You can change those buttons. I thought it was CKEditor based. Oh, excuse me, CKEditor based. Uh, sorry, it was going to be TinyMC, then it was going to be Aloha, now it's CK Editor 4. Um, and um, it, uh, as you update uh, buttons and change buttons, it'll actually change the text and input fields um, to do that, which is uh, having that filtering sort of one to one is really, really important. And I would say this is also part of a larger sort of overhaul of the sort of modern authoring experience in the product. This is something that Acquia, through their Spark initiative, did some really great work on, not only in the WYSIWYG, but also on the larger experience. That as content editors who are coming into Drupal to actually sort of enter content, like they're expecting something that, you know, they have on the left, that there are different fields, and on the right, some of the settings for that content. And to making that process as easy and as user-friendly as possible. Not everybody is a developer who understands HTML and just write that into a field. That You need to have different tools and processes to actually allow people to have really clean authoring experiences. That's what makes websites really great. 
And I think that's something that Drupal 8 has, has done, a, done a lot to work with. But I'll show a little bit of this, this later. In addition, we also have a really cool sort of inline editing uh, kind of functionality. Uh, this is something that CK Editor uh, allows um, us to do, where we can actually have the individual fields, be it images, tags, body type, where you can actually sort of through an edit link start to actually edit it on the page. And this is something that may not be that useful in practice for a lot of people, but it's something that for certain use cases will totally make it work really well and will also help Drupal demo really well against some of the bigger WCM systems that have this functionality. But it's just another tool that you have sort of as an administrator to help to build the best possible, possible site and keep the content fresh. Additionally, Drupal 8 has taken a, a really sort of mobile first, mobile friendly approach to the design. Uh, one of the things that will be awesome is that the core themes that ship with Drupal, Drupal 8 will be responsive and ready for mobile devices. This establishes a set of patterns and processes for sort of doing that for new themes that you would build. Um, as you know, a lot of you are, are familiar, the number of mobile devices in the world is just taking off tablets, cell phones, et cetera. And that you know, as Drupal seeks to be sort of a, you know, a really good system for a lot of different people to use, supporting those different devices natively is important. Yeah. The REST API is key to that, too, because in, in a lot of cases, you want to provide the native mobile experience, and then you can use Drupal as the content package. Yeah, and I think in some ways, I feel like that's sort of what Dave was saying. That's sort of the one of the mantras of Drupal 8, is that there, there actually gets to be a really nice separation between the content you're storing and the presentation that you have. And that, you know, making sure you have a clean presentation that's responsive and uses HTML5, like, like Drupal does, is really important. But being able to sort of separate your presentation layer from your, your, sort of, your sort of data store is really important. And that brings us to the modern templating system called Twig that is now shipping with Drupal 8. Um, and Twig, Twig is, I think, for front-end developers, very much a game changer for Drupal. That previously, if you were going to build a Drupal theme, you had to use this, this system called PHP template that was like made in a basement in South Africa like, like seven or so years ago. And, and PHP template was awesome. It got Drupal where it was. But it, it required a lot of programming, and it, it had PHP, and it, it also, you know, you had to be a little more of a professional sort of developer that knew a lot of the back end of Drupal to make it work. Twig is great because it's, it's very much about here's your templates, here's some tokens that are swapped in, but you can work with it like normal markup language that you don't have to have as much concern for the security of, the pro of, of your templates because that filtering is happening by default already. You don't have to do check planes or check, check, you know, filtering out XSS to make that work. Um, this is also very much, as Dave was saying, part of that proudly invented elsewhere, uh, elsewhere uh, philosophy. This is something that Twig is something that Symphony uses already. It's something other projects like look at and work with, and it's a pattern that's familiar to people. And it's not some just Drupalism we invented. It's something that, that other people use and we're continuing to improve. And that, I think, is really, really important. Bringing us even closer to the possibility of being able to configure CSS and HTML your way to an actually pretty sophisticated website. Which we would love, love to see happen, I think. But Twig will be awesome. It'll make front-end developers really, really happy. It'll improve the security of Drupal sites. And it will help us do some really awesome stuff. The well, last just a little shout I want to do is around multiple multilingual capabilities. Um, Drupal, I feel, has always been really strong with multilingual technology. Uh, Drupal, for those who don't know, came out of Belgium and into you know was used a lot in Europe, and there's a lot of different language requirements there. But one of the things that was a little tricky is to get all of the multilingual translation stuff working required a number of different contrib modules put together in a, a, a sort of specific way. And one of the great things about Drupal 8 is a lot of that's bundled back into the core that you have translation interfaces and easy sort of, you know, views filters to get all of the language stuff working correctly. And I think that one of the things we're also seeing is we have a more global audience looking at websites. English is not the only language people speak and care about in this world. And providing open source tools for everyone requires that we support a wide variety of those, of those language, language packs. And Drupal 8 is providing a really great way to do that. And one of the really interesting things about the multilingual capabilities in Drupal 8 are, is not just that it supports displaying different multilingual things, but that it supports that entire workflow for creating those translations, which uh, a lot of organizations dealing with um, legacy CMS products are basically having to export text files, give them to a team, say, translate this, import them back into the system, and they're really not experiencing 
the full breadth that content management can provide in terms of being able to provide a managed interface for everyone to work in, including the translators. Yeah, we have a freaking content management system. <laughs> Let's use it to translate. Drupal 8 does that. And we'll see a lot of really great multilingual sites, sites, sites there. But I think sort of big picture, I mean, Drupal 8 is, you know, we're at the sort of the margins of this great harvest of new functionality, 200 new features and improvements that are coming in Drupal 8. We've talked about some of our favorites, but there's a lot more sort of under the hood and for specific use cases. The Drupal 8, it, while it's taken a long time, like that's, it wasn't just people idling. Like there's been a lot of work happening for the last four years thinking about and then coding the, uh, this, op this uh, content management system. And a lot of those sort of features and improvements that were made were made because of frustrations or things people want to do in Drupal 7, but they couldn't. And I think that's a really awesome place to be, that we're sort of sitting here on the brink of having this really awesome tool from some of our favorite people that can continue to build websites in the future. So with that, I'll turn it over to David to sort of talk about Pantheon and how sort of we run Drupal 8 and why you might, uh, what stuff you might be interested in there. So we started with Drupal 8 as itself because we, uh, one of the remarkable things about Drupal 8 is that it was built for platforms. Uh, Pantheon's always been built for Drupal, but this is the first Drupal that's been built for platforms. And a lot of the capabilities that Drupal 8 introduces are ones that you realize simply by deploying Drupal 8 with the existing capabilities on these platforms. But uh, I wanted to highlight some of the things that are uniquely available uh, as you work with Drupal 8 on Pantheon. Uh, first of all, we have one-click spin-up of Drupal 8 now. Um, this has actually been the case for a while through going to the landing page, but it's, it is now one of the top options for every time you start a site on, on the platform. Um, this means that we have full support for it, all the way upgrading through the release candidates, through the release, um, and it's safe to start projects that you're actually planning on delivering to customers on Pantheon. Uh, this is not just a toy anymore uh, for Drupal 8. Uh, we have uh, our entire support team um, set up um, not only having documented um, all the integrations with Drupal 8, but ready to handle your inquiries uh, for building um, serious projects on it. And of course, we'll let you spin up the, the most current site. It's, it's RC1 here, but we have RC2 uh, currently being deployed um, for, for new sites. Um, One-click updates have been on the platform for a long time, but because Drupal 8 includes a ton more in core in terms of views and configuration management um, and Twig and all these other uh, sort of uh, projects part of Symfony, that uh, the one-click updates are more comprehensive than ever. Uh, that means that there's less that you have to keep track of in terms of contributed modules, um, and the ability to script this and use it from the GUI um, is going to go farther than ever for maintaining sites. And if you haven't played around with our one-click update technology, it's super awesome. We, you, you, today, you install a Drupal 8 site, it'll install an RC2, you'll have it, you'll start developing. Yeah, when RC3 comes out, you'll have a you know an email sent and just one button to update to RC3. Then when the actual 8.0.0 release comes out on November 19th, you'll have one button to upgrade to that. That'll all be managed in Git, and it'll allow you to stay up to date with that technology, which is awesome. Yep. And um, one of the other things about migrations with Drupal 8, I mentioned the migrate module already and how it's turning the best practice into what's delivered in Drupal core, but in this case, uh, one of the key things to be able to realize that value is to be able to simultaneously be running your Drupal 6 or 7 site and your Drupal 8 site. And you want to be running them on representative infrastructure. You don't want to be setting up an arbitrary VM or server just for your Drupal 8 site so that you can run the version of PHP and the database you want. Uh, you don't want to be wedging Drupal 8 into an existing cluster configured for Drupal 6 or 7. And you don't want to have to spin up an entirely separate um, pre-production cluster just to be able to test out your migrations to 8 and be able to get your kind of pre-migration backlog filled out for any kind of things that you need to finish before making the leap. So this is ideally suited to systems on Pantheon where uh, you can keep your Drupal 6 or 7 site, you can keep running the version of PHP that you're running on there, you can run the, uh, the correct Drush version with those releases, you can simultaneously set up um, a, uh, a kind of single stack or kind of HA cluster for Drupal 8, you can, <laughs> you can test migrations to it, uh, and then you're going to be able to get an immediate list of things that you may need to fix or that didn't migrate properly because 
knowledge is really powerful early in the process, knowing what is making the jump properly and what's not. So uh, because it's free, we recommend trying to set up a Drupal 8 site as soon as you're ready to uh, and trying out that migration technology so that you can see what, what works for you. Yeah, it's a, I mean, just to sort of underscore, for Drupal 8, when you're upgrading Drupal 8, you're going to need to rebuild your site. Drupal 8 is like 95% new code. It has a lot of new functionality you'll want to build and take advantage of. And that realistically, you want to move your content from your Drupal 6 or 7 site to Drupal 8 all of the programming and the theme and stuff, you will redo. And that's okay because, you know, it's been a while, you want to create a new sort of fancier website. Um, and we'll, we'll allow you to do that really easily on Pantheon. Uh, and we have a really nicely hardened stack uh, to run Drupal 8 with all of the components that you'd expect. I'll go into the details of some of the other components, but of course the key runtime is PHP 5.5, which we've been running for years uh, through our experience with WordPress. Um, it's actually really important to have experience running PHP 5.5 because a lot of things have changed since 5.3 and 5.4. Uh, one of the most important is that the op cache uh, from Zend is now the standard baked in uh, release. Uh, APC is basically going by the sidelines at this point. Um, it's still technically compatible with 5.5, but we wanted to run what is faster, uh, actually less buggy. Um, uh, you may have seen errors in the past uh, with APC where it says like a class is redeclared or something like that. Those are bugs in APC. Um, and P Zen's opcache just does not have those issues. And since Drupal 8 is more object oriented than ever, it's more important than ever than to be handling these things carefully and efficiently. So uh, we've tuned that opcache configuration. We include APC U, which is actually just the user object storage portions of APC so that you can still do the kind of local in-memory caching that people have used in previous releases. Um, and we've also updated our backtrace reporting extension for PHP 5.5's internals so that we can actually uh, continue to provide those backtraces for fatal issues to the dashboard, as our users expect, um, all on this latest release. Um, and we are in, in the middle stages of testing 5.6 to make that available as soon as we finish the QA on it. Uh, but that's not the only part of a modern platform. Um, there's a whole complicated stack that's actually necessary to deliver a great experience on Drupal 8 uh, on uh, these sorts of um, CMS tasks. So uh, one of the biggest ones that's uh, changing is that we now have Varnish 4 uh, at our edge on almost all of our edge clusters for new, well, for all of our edge clusters for new sites. Um, and what that means is that it can stream objects in the back end on a cache miss and coordinate those cache misses so that if you suddenly have a whole bunch of people clicking on a URL, it will basically aggregate those, make one request to the back end, cache that, and service all of those clients in one um, distribution so that Drupal doesn't have to get hit by a stampede as soon as you get, say, a, uh, a link on a really popular website. It also provides a um, really sophisticated background refresh of expired objects, which means that for popular objects on a website, it's going to be able to request a fresh version of that and pre-populate its cache before the current cache version expires. So you won't go through the kind of varnish three and before behavior of cache, 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 stampede, cache, 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 cache. Uh, so um, the combination of those two features uh, means that there's better protection than ever for the actual content management system. Um, and uh, the other biggest one that you'll see on Pantheon is that we're now delivering MariaDB 10.0, uh, which provides a few big benefits for Drupal sites. Um, the biggest, in my opinion, is that it has online schema changes for common operations. If you're doing things like adding columns to a table, adding indexes, uh, and a few other really common things that modules do on their updates, those actually don't lock the database or even the single table that it's updating at, the, at that time, which means that schema updates will generally not take down the live site anymore. Uh, you don't have to worry about as much of a maintenance window. Uh, you don't have to worry about um, those uh, visitors getting a bad experience on the website. Um, the other key things are that full text is now available on InnerDB, uh, which is one of the few remaining reasons that anyone used my ISAM. Full text is still not the recommended approach. We still recommend using Solar on Pantheon when possible, but uh, it's still um, 
uh, it's still an option, and if you're migrating a legacy project that depends on that, then it's a neat thing. Um, and then there are a bunch of other things that are improvements in replication uh, and NoSQL storage backends that are available in MariaDB um, that we'll be looking at releasing in the future uh, to Pantheon customers. Drops 8 uh, is our repository for, um, for Drupal 8, uh, just like we have Drops 6 and 7 right now. Uh, and we've done two major changes. Uh, one is that um, Git is going to be really fast to clone your projects because we've squashed the history. We're now doing a single commit per release, starting with the RCs. And so um, you're just going to be able to start up those projects that, that much faster for local development. Uh, and we've also changed our method of integration with the platform to be based in settings.php rather than changes to bootstrap. So all of core is actually 100% stock uh, at this point. And um, as uh, we've always had some of these features that are really ready to go for CMI, but now that Drupal 8 is approaching release, uh, it really delivers on that dream, I think. Uh, because uh, <clears throat> there are a few capabilities in Pantheon that really make that uh, great. Uh, one is that um, for elite sites and for agencies, you have access to multi-dev, which means that you can now do config, you can create views in a sandbox, you can do configuration changes in the sandbox, you can QA them, you can code review them, you can merge them. Um, for people doing basic content man uh, configuration management, uh, they're now able to uh, to do it an entirely, almost entirely GUI-centric way where you can export the configuration. Currently requires the CLI, but I'll show a tool in a second that we're about to, uh, we're about to release to customers. Um, but when you export configuration from a Drupal 8 site uh, to an SFDP development site, what that means is that it writes out the configuration to the working copy and we can commit it for you so you don't have to write any PHP, you don't have to know Git, uh, and you're still able to work on a team that's managing configuration using these tools. Uh, so configuration truly flows alongside code. And out of the box, Drupal 8 on Pantheon is configured to write its configuration on export to the right place to be committed to the project so they can follow the normal practices. Um, and I was saying how the complex cases also need to be possible. So not only does configuration management deliver a, a really nice basic experience, of click, 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 export, commit, uh, and then basically back up the configuration for a site or deploy it. Uh, but for really complex cases where you have teams working together, where you have um, QA, where you have um, hot fixes happening to a site, that's where it starts to really shine because you get to take advantage of all of the power tools that Git offers uh, to manage that data just like you're managing the code. Um, and then back to the simple cases, I was mentioning how we are um, uh, putting the finishing touches on a configuration export tool for people using SFTP development. For, for those not super familiar with development on Pantheon, SFTP development mean, means that Drupal can update its own code files uh, in that development environment, and you can connect over SFTP to write new files, and then you see those changes on the dashboard, and you can commit them from the dashboard. So with the export configuration button and SFTP mode, you do not have to use any CLI tool, you don't have to know Git, and you don't have to do anything other than click in Drupal to configure what you want and then deploy it out to production after you've done um, QA on it. And uh, with that, I will hand you back to MMLC. <laughs> All right, so that's like a lot of cool stuff I'm using it with Pantheon, and there's definitely more stuff to come. I mean, this is, uh, Drupal 8's obviously a serious release, the future of Drupal, and at Pantheon we care a lot about Drupal and are very interested in, in building more tools. But let me go ahead and show you sort of how all this works. Um, Drupal 8, of course, is available on Pantheon right now. You can go to pantheon.io slash d8 and spin up a site right now uh, to, to try it. But I'll go ahead and sort of show you um, how that kind of stuff can work. Uh, this is the Pantheon dashboard. I've um, already gone ahead and logged in uh, to one of my many accounts on the platform. And one of the great things you can do is when you create a new site, we now have you know, you know, my great D8 site for today. Uh, that's our spin up technology. You name your site, it'll give you a URL. And then one of the things you'll see sort of in the list of, of configurable start states 
is we have the Drupal 8 RC2, the biggest update in Drupal history. And with one click of a button, you can go ahead and, and get it installed. It only takes about a minute, uh, and we'll provision you PHP 5. We'll get the latest version of Drupal 8 from, uh, from our Drops 8 repository. We'll set up your access controls. We'll give you a dev test live environment. We'll um, make sure that everything is sort of running great. But like any good cooking show, uh, we'll put that into the oven, and I'll go ahead and show you a site I've already sp I spun up just a minute ago. Um, and that's Drupal 8. It's all happening. So once you basically complete the installation, you'll get a sort of place that looks like this. Should look a lot like Pantheon normally, except it's now running Drupal 8. The only thing that I've done is actually just uh, done an export of the config and built a dev test a live environment. So we have dev dash right here. Congratulations, you installed Drupal. We have uh, test and we have live. And one of the things sort of I want to show off sort of is not only does it run on Pantheon, hey, Drupal 8, this is awesome, but that there's this opportunity to use the configuration management tools that both Dave and I spoke so warmly of to really make really awesome sites. So one of the things that you'll sort of see sort of in this Drupal 8 situation is you've got a lot of the normal stuff that you're sort of used to seeing, um, but there's some new stuff. For example, we've got this toolbar at the top that's a sort of similar to administration menu in Drupal 7, but this is it's just called Toolbar, and it's like just part of, of, Drupal, of Drupal 8. It's also awesome because it's got really great responsive properties, same as everything in the Drupal 8 uh, themes, so that you can use it on a mobile device or a tablet as well. But I think having that bar at the top that's used for everyone is going to be really important just for administrators and um, everything else. On the Manage Content screen, we have a really great list of all the content on our site. We don't have any at the moment, but one of the things you might notice is that this actually is a view right here to list the content. That's not just some hacky like table-like render table like in Drupal 7. This actually is using the Views module, and you can extend this or modify this later. When we hit Add Content, we have a sort of normal article and basic page situation. Um, but when we actually go in to actually edit the individual page, we have that published green. So we can, you know, my great post, and, you know, this is, you can actually use all the different WYSIWYG tools right out of the box. This is something previously we would have had to configure and really, really struggle over. Now it just all exists, and I can make sure that it gets, you know, you know dealt, with, dealt with relatively easily. And I can go ahead and publish that, which is really awesome. Um, on the, in the sort of module space, you can see under Extend, there are actually a ton of different really cool modules that are part of Core. A bunch of stuff from some of the field types we talked about to views to other stuff have all been added, added into Core. So in some ways, Core is the biggest release ever because there's the most modules, but it's also the kind of thing that a lot of these, these technologies, things like Migrate, that you're going to really be interested in using to, to migrate from 6 to 7 to 8, are already included. You don't need to find them elsewhere. They're fully integrated, supported by the core development process. But probably the coolest module is that configuration management module that we talked about. It's available under, of course, configuration. Um, and it allows you to actually do the kinds of managed workflow deployments that I think are going to be really important in Drupal. So because you're going to have a use case like this. I'm a developer. I'm working on my new site on the dev environment. I just started it, and I want to actually go and start to do create some content. So I can go into my dev environment, I can look at my content types, and I can decide I'd like to actually start to build a blog system. So I could say blog and call it a burst of, of genius, because not that's actually pretty generous to myself, but um, we'll, uh, we'll sort of create that content type, and we'll go ahead and add some fields to that content type. One of the great things, as I mentioned, is we have a lot more field types than we do out of Drupal 7 out of the box, which is really great. Um, we can have, you know, sort of, you know, date, email, this kind of link, these kind of things. These are pretty awesome, as well as, you know, do images and this kind of stuff. So we could go ahead and do an image. We could call it a blog image. And we can start to add that kind of stuff there to the, to, to the thing. And this isn't anything that's going to be super crazy for Drupal developers, but I think the really great thing in the context of Drupal 8 is that these are sort of configuration changes that previously were sort of difficult to actually take from a dev environment to a test environment and then to a live environment. 
that these are things we have some solutions, Drupal 7, there's like a features module and some other stuff in Contrib that you can use. And those are not bad solutions, but they're not perfect either. And they're specifically not core solutions. So they're constantly sort of chasing the, the different modules they support and trying to make it all work. One of the great things about Drupal is that this kind of stuff exists um, in, in a more structured way. Because there is this configuration management technology that David was talking about. There's some more sort of extensive demos about it. But one of the things that we can do is um, using our command line tool for um, uh, called Terminus for Pantheon, which by the way we'll use, we'll create like uh, command line options to do all the different sort of clicking around the dashboard that, that you might like. We can actually do, um, we could run a drush command, Terminus, drush, cite this, environment equal this, and we can actually take that blog content type that I just created with that blog image field and actually represent it as specific YAML files right here. This is exactly what the button on the dashboard I was uh, showing the comps of uh, will be doing. Yeah, and that'll make this a lot easier. I mean, running a drush command isn't crazy hard, but getting it sort of more integrated is important because these are the kinds of patterns we expect developers to see do over and over again. They'll work in dev. They'll, t they'll create some content types, change their theme, install some modules, change, make some views. All of these things exist as uh, configurable YAML files that are structured information that provide all of the different configuration options we need. And with a single sort of commit through our, our, our product, we can say, you know, blog system. And we can actually take those YAML files and provide them as an individual exported item that exists in Git. And this is something from a sort of professional sort of, at the beginning I was talking about Drupal 8 being a really important tool for teams building complex sites. This is a tool that really facilitates that kind of work because it allows for individual teams who are working on a development branch or using our multi-dev tool working across multiple branches. You can create individual feature sets to say, okay, now I want a slideshow environment to build a slideshow. I want um, I want a news news release system to you know have news releases. I already have my blog system. Maybe I'll build a profile system, and then each of these individual Git feature branches can exist as its own sort of code pathway. You can do the configuration and the development that you need to actually make those systems real, and then simply by hitting a button to deploy the code, this is the blog system from one environment to another, you can actually move that configuration along with any other code to the new environment. And that's really, really important because now I'm sitting here in my test environment trying to like, you know, sort of see what this test is going to look like. And in the test environment, I don't have that blog content type. Like if I go to create, um, create that blog content, there's not going to be that option. I traditionally would have to use something like features or just retype all of my commands to make that work. But one of the things that's awesome is because I've moved that code into the, into the test environment, I can actually go into my configuration management module in Drupal 8 and do a synchronization option. Which this, is, this is also one of the checkbox options and the comps uh, that are going to be possible from the dashboard directly. Yeah, because when I do a deployment, I want to also deploy all the configuration I did. And you'll see it's actually going through each of the configuration screens that I, I wanted, doing the um, uh, ooh, do a little craziness with the blog teaser, but um, getting it more or less set up so that I actually now have the ability to create a blog right here and being able to do something like, you know, this is my great blog, provide that content type, do that image, and now have that content exist as that new content type. And that would then work in views, that would work with image styles, that would work with any other configuration. And so I have a lot of confidence that like, if that worked in my test environment, guess what? When I deploy it to my live environment, that that's something that I have a lot of, of visibility of what it's gonna look like. And when I deploy it into live, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get that blog system set up more or less the way I want. And that's part of, I think, sort of the larger sort of view of Drupal 8 is that we're trying to provide features in Drupal 8 and have Pantheon support those features, but have Drupal 8 provide this experience where we can use modern development practices. That in 2011, it was really only some of the larger sites and more professional web development agencies that used like full dev test live production 
workflows or even use feature branching through multi-dev. But now, sort of 2015, 2016, this is basically the standard for people doing this as professional workers. And that having a system like Drupal 8 that can take that configuration and put it into that professional workflow process is super, super important because it lets the development talent focus on building really awesome new stuff instead of struggling with you know, using features or using the deployments and stuff like that. And I think that there's a lot of stuff in Drupal 8. The configuration management we showed you, getting the WYSIWYG right we showed you, there's um, the, the REST module that will actually you know, sort of kick out your content using structured data instead of HTML, the you know, responsive mobile stuff. All of these things are set up to provide patterns and structures to build websites for, for as sort of modern web applications. And I think that'll allow developers to focus less on sort of the plumbing of this kind of stuff and focus more on building really great futures and designs for their, for their people. So that I think is a, is a pretty awesome, uh, awesome situation. So with that, that's just a quick demo. I just wanted to show off the configuration management because that is our favorite feature. But I'd also say like Drupal 8 is, has 200 individual features and improvements. And this is something that I would recommend that you know, all of you jump into Drupal 8, try it on Pantheon, try to do a migration and play around with it yourself. That's really important just to learning and everything else. So I'll turn over to David to uh, close this out. Yep. So um, we've been talking a lot about uh, Drupal 8's features, how Pantheon makes them easy to use and straightforward, uh, but we don't want to just try and um, uh, <clears throat> leave you without uh, some advice on new projects and um, the things yet to overcome in Drupal 8. Uh, one thing is that we believe that you should start developing with Drupal 8 today. New projects should probably be on Drupal 8. About the only thing I can think of that is truly a hurdle for Drupal 8 projects is probably solar support, uh, and even that is probably going to be landing uh, in the next few months. Uh, so starting off with brand new projects on Drupal 8 is almost, like, this is the best time that I've ever seen in terms of a Drupal release um, and it being capable of building projects. Um, the, but it takes some work. Um, for every feature that we've made more familiar to people coming from outside Drupal, it's something that uh, people need to relearn on the Drupal side because it's no longer a Drupalism. It's a kind of either PHPism or good software architectureism. Uh, and uh, you might want to pick up an IDE. Uh, there's some really popular ones out there, um, all the way from PHP Storm to Eclipse with PHP's extensions. But with all of the um, uh, layers of object orientation, it's sometimes nice to have it digesting it for you. Um, and while the front end looks super similar to Drupal 7, uh, it's 95% new code in the internals. So it's uh, don't expect to find necessarily the same functionality in the same places. It's the biggest transition that has ever occurred on Drupal, way larger than Drupal 6 to 7 or 5 to 6, or 4.7 to 5. Uh, and it's also a work in progress. Um, the, uh, we haven't quite shipped Drupal 8.0.0, so I wouldn't necessarily expect it to be a flawless experience right now, but it's definitely stable enough to get started on projects, and um, by and large, uh, you probably won't run into blockers that actually prevent you from getting client work done. Um, but, of course, be realistic with your launch dates. Um, I wouldn't expect to launch a Drupal 8 site at the end of this month. Um, you might want to um, have it as a projection for some time. Uh, I would say early 2016 is uh, the very first time that I would kind of, like, take it to production. Yeah, I mean, and your mileage may vary. There are, there are several large Drupal 8 sites that run right now on the Internet. I think it depends a little bit on your feature set, on your development team and also on your experience, because there's a lot of learning that will need to happen for Drupal 8, and you'll need to have some time to ramp up. And we've also moved to semantic versioning for Drupal um, 8 uh, series, where um, Drupal 8.x.x is for compatibility, 8.1 will introduce new features, 8.0.1 will introduce bug fixes and security fixes, uh, potentially. So what we're seeing here now is we have the opportunity to be releasing new features on Drupal far before Drupal 9 comes out, and it won't necessarily require a big compatibility shift for sites. Uh, your Drupal 8.0 sites should be updatable to Drupal 8.1 without breaking uh, the sites. Um, and I just wanted to thank you for uh, coming to our webinar to talk about what's awesome for Drupal 8 and um, what you can find with Drupal 8 and Pantheon.
Yeah, uh, it's been nice for sort of chatting about Drupal 8. There's obviously a lot more really awesome stuff that exists there. But we're also interested in just doing a little bit of questions for folks. So they have some questions of stuff that we talked about in the presentation or stuff that, um, that just about Drupal 8 that they're, they're, they're curious about. Dave and I know a lot about it um, and are definitely interested in, in sharing the knowledge that we do have. All righty, guys. We're going to try and answer as many questions as we can. And let's start with what are the best resources for learning about the new features in Drupal 8? Yeah, so this is a really great question and something I think Drupal 8, as we mentioned, is like a 95%-ish, you know, rewrite or change to Drupal. There's still a lot of familiar stuff there, but it's, you know, a different style. It's object-oriented programming. It requires, you know, um, so some of the symphony stuff, and you're going to need to relearn. I'd also say that, like, some of the older older blog posts and information on this is not actually up to, it's not actually current. There's a lot of stuff that's been written about Drupal 8 that stuff has changed in some ways important in, in important ways. So I would say that um, first, you know, we have a really nice like Drupal 8 landing page on our website, um, pandanio slash Drupal 8, that has, has some links to some resources. I also think that having, um, going to the drupal.org slash planet sort of blog, blog series, there's a lot of really, uh, you know, incredible programmers and, and development shops that are publishing really inf interesting information. Uh, frankly, I would recommend installing it and seeing how far you can get just with configuration, because uh, it's really hard to go wrong when you're just clicking around a GUI um, in, in that sort of sandbox, uh, and you'd be surprised how much you can accomplish by just configuring your way to it in Drupal 8. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think, you know, see, you know, seeing how far you can get, seeing what your questions are really important. Um, definitely look in at doing some trainings. Um, the, our friend Doug Van is having an online training, uh, dougvan.com. He talks about it on his blog. There's a drupalize.me has a really great Drupal 8 training also online. And a bunch of other, other shots. Build a module has some really great Drupal content. And these are like online resources. You can watch some videos, sometimes for money, sometimes for free, to sort of learn about, um, learn about, learn about your favorite content management system. Um, I'd also give a little shout out. If you're actually going to start in and get to do programming of a Drupal 8 module, um, Drupal 8 modules are different than Drupal 7 modules. And one of my favorite tools is a, is a tool called Drupal Console, which is sort of similar to Drush, but it um, uses the Symfony Console tool. And it does similar stuff to Drush in some ways, but the stuff that I think is really the best feature is the Generate feature, where you can actually use Drupal Console to generate scaffolding for your Drupal 8 modules. And this is something, if you're looking to get going quickly, this is a good way to sort of build that boilerplate in so you can actually start building useful stuff and so struggling to get the syntax right. So I would check that out at drupalconsole.com. Alrighty, next question is, is Drupal 8 the future? Would Pantheon support backdrop? Um, yeah, so Drupal 8 is the future of Drupal. Um, it's not, and it is the future of a part of the web. But it's absolutely our belief that, like, to build a better web for everyone, we need to have a variety of different tools to use. So WordPress is a really important tool. It is great for a lot of different use cases. We think people are going to do very well with that. Drupal 7 is something that people are still running and will be successful with for years to come. Backdrop is a fork of Drupal 7 that has things like configuration management and WYSIWYG. Um, it does run on Pantheon. If you go to the backdropcms.org, there's a try and Pantheon link. You can run it there. Um, and then, of course, Drupal 8. This is an ecosystem of open source options. I think that's sort of the right way to, 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 to go. Righty, next question. Will Pantheon add a run config import checkbox on the workflow development steps like currently exists for update.php and clear caches? Yes. Uh, as you can see on the screenshots here, uh, for the one version we're testing, not only is there an export configuration button that makes it staged for committing, but when you deploy, um, you can see that there's a checkbox uh, for import configuration from code, and you can see oh, uh, an additional checkbox for overwrite configuration changes in database. Um, and that will allow uh, skipping um, having to go to the actual CMS or running a Drush command post-deployment for that. All right, next question. What do you think regarding the performance D8 versus D7? Have you slash anybody tested the, the performance using Apache Benchmark to compare the D7 and D8? So I think um, one thing I just sort of sort of throw out there for performance um, for 
handing it to David, who knows a lot more about this, is is be careful of benchmarks between Drupal 7 and 8 on the internet. Um, one very important change in Drupal 8 is that page caching is enabled by default in Drupal 8. It was not enabled by default in Drupal 7. So if you compare the two, Drupal 8's gonna, it, it's just gonna be a night and day difference and it's not gonna be that accurate just because of that one change. The other big difference is uh, kind of proportional loading of the environment on Drupal 8 where depending on the request you do, the amount of uh, dependencies that get loaded for it could vary wildly. So while Drupal 8 mostly loaded the same environment for every request before executing it, Drupal 8 will not. Uh, so it, uh, Drupal 8 will vary wildly depending on what page you're running. Um, I think that on net, um, it's actually going to be pretty comparable or possibly in favor of Drupal 8 if uh, caching is configured properly uh, because it's just done better in Drupal 8, both from the page level all the way down to the object and page component level. Uh, and ultimately, that's more important than the actual optimizations within the CMS itself. Yeah, that, holistically, it's about performance to the to the end user, and there's a lot of great crashing strategies to really improve that in Drupal 8. And kind of on that same note, um, our next question is, what are the treacherous aspects to watch out for when updating a complex application from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8? Yeah, I, I'd say to start that out, I mean, the big, biggest the biggest treachery there is that you're going to, if especially if you've done a lot of custom code, you're going to have to rebuild a lot of that code for Drupal 8. Or figure out if you can just configure an alternative. Like, it's not necessarily an act, like, that's the best way to do it is, to go from custom code to a configured alternative on Drupal. Oh, for sure, for sure. And, and, and people, I think, will be pleasantly surprised. Stuff they needed to hobble together a few contrib modules with some glue code actually is a lot easier to do in Drupal 8 without that. But especially if you have a very tailored custom application, you're going to have to rewrite that application um, to you know either use the existing Drupal 8 stuff or new stuff, and that's going to be a bit of work. Um, you're also going to have to learn migrate module that like, you know, migrating the data is actually pretty cool. You can sort of simulate runs and, and redo runs and, and do them constantly. But it's a learning curve if you haven't used migrate module before to get your head around. But the, the great part is that um, everything is kind of in place now, at least on Pantheon, to be able to set up that Drupal 8 test site, you can, which you can do for free, and then try out um, that migration. And there's going to be no better indicator of the amount of work that you have to do to migrate to Drupal 8 than uh, trying it and seeing exactly in which areas uh, you need to um, fix things. Yeah, and that's something I think we'll see when people are upgrading their sites to Drupal 8. They'll tip it, they're going to have a Drupal 7 and a Drupal 8 site running of basically the same site, and maybe nightly it'll 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 migrate the data from 7 to 8 just to just to keep that going. And so you'll have a lot of time to sort of get it right before you launch. You'll also need to decide whether you want to go kind of front-end natively in Drupal 8 or decouple front-end because that will massively affect how you build the replacement site as well. All right, next question. Um, a viewer is curious as to what Matt and David think the long-term horizon is for D7. Will it be limited by PHP support before it is limited by the release of D9? Probably not um, because uh, even if you look at the latest PHP 5.6 release, you're not seeing a lot of deprecated that would affect Drupal 7. Um, the main thing that, uh, in fact, I don't believe there's anything that's in use, at least in Drupal 7 core, that is technically deprecated on the current 5.5 release. Um, you will see uh, one or two things in Drupal 6 core. Uh, there is an older regular expression function used in Drupal 6 uh, that um, has been deprecated, but I do not believe it's even removed as of PHP 5.6. So uh, typically, you're not going to run into that. Uh, one of the big confusions that exists is that people um, are assuming that PHP releases are as dramatic as they used to be uh, and as like kind of untested versus CMS and framework projects as it used to be, whereas right now, PHP actually, and for the last few years, has been moving to kind of a release cadence where they release every 6 to 12 months, uh, and they do not gratuitously break compatibility the way that previous releases did. So there's a world of difference between 5.3 to 5.4 all the way up to 5.6 um, versus what would have happened before between 4.x releases or earlier 5.x releases. So uh, you're just not going to see as many cases where it just breaks. Um, I wouldn't be 
surprised if there are some issues on PHP 7, but PHP 7 isn't quite released yet, so I'm hesitant to make claims of whether Drupal 7 will work with it or not. Um, it's, it's likely that it will, though. It is one of the things that it's tested against. Yeah, I'd also say sort of in the, on the general question, like, how long will Drupal 7 be around? I mean, Drupal 8's awesome. New sites, I think we'll get a lot out of using Drupal 8. But let's be real. There's over 100,000 Drupal 6 sites that still run, including economist.com, whitehouse.gov. Like, there's really big Drupal 6 projects. And Drupal 7 will be around for a very long time. It's not going to go anywhere. Like, people have existing sites. They're not going to want to upgrade or they're going to upgrade later. And so I think you can have a good, a, like, a nice future with respect to, to Drupal 7. Um, I think sort of the question also mentioned Drupal 9. I think one thing that sort of to sort of explain, there will probably be a Drupal 9 in the future, but the current process is this release on the 19th of November is Drupal 8.0.0. There will be, you know, an 8.0.1, you know, bug fix, security release release. But then there's also going to be sort of using of this semantic versioning technology uh, or semantic versioning process, a uh, 8.1 release of Drupal that will have some new features uh, for Drupal 8. So we'll actually have a, a nice future of having 8.1, 8.2, 8.3 with new features before a Drupal 9 comes out. So, I mean, I think it's really cool to use new stuff. There's going to be a lot of really great excitement around that. But I think for existing sites, worth looking to upgrade, but... You know, it's not like Drupal 7 is going to go away anytime soon. There's a lot of sites using it, and they'll continue to use it. Okay, next question is, how far along are we with some of the key contrib modules? Yeah, so um, one thing for folks, you know, following along at home that's important in the Drupal world is Drupal core is only Drupal core. There's a lot of other modules you need to make a website real, um, and those modules also needed to be upgraded. And that was something from a... In the Drupal 7 cycle, we saw that Drupal 7 came out in January of 2011, but it was six to nine months before a lot of the modules that people really needed to make websites we got upgraded, and that slowed adoption. I think one thing that's really important for this cycle for Drupal 8 is that a lot of the modules, like views, that people really need to uh, use um, are already in core, and so we don't have to wait for views module to be upgraded before we can use Drupal 8. But there's other, a lot of other modules as well. Um, there's a bluespark.com has a pretty nice like top 100 contributed modules Drupal 8 update status like list where you can see, hey, you know, Chaos Tools has this, you know, Alpha 17 release. Token module has an 8.x dev. Path Auto 8.x dev. Libraries module has some as a dev release. And you can sort of look at it that way. But I think one of the things we'll see is that because there's a lot of stuff in core, people can move into Drupal 8 development faster, and that a lot of the contrib modules people need will get a little more help because people will really be really building real sites. But your mileage may vary. You're definitely going to want to check out which modules you're going to use, and looking at sort of the status of them on Drupal org will be helpful in evaluating whether or not you want to upgrade um, and, that, and your strategy around that. Alrighty, next question is, what is the status of e-commerce on D8? Is it production ready? Um, yeah, so uh, one thing that Drupal does do is, um, is e-commerce. Uh, it's, uh, it's definitely not its forte necessarily, but there are a lot of, of really great projects that will implement aspects of e-commerce into Drupal. Um, probably the biggest, uh, the biggest package is Drupal Commerce that does, um, uh, that, that, that does sort of a full sort of e-commerce kind of store. Uh, they don't, Drupal Commerce does not have an 8.x release out right now, but there is a, a dev branch uh, that's getting a, a lot of attention for 8.x uh, right now. So um, it's not currently usable. You can install it and make it work, but I would, I would cruise over to Drupal.org slash project slash commerce, and you can sort of see the status of, uh, of their Drupal 8 work. I would also say, like, um, just like a big difference between when people are starting to build sites with Drupal 7 versus Drupal 8, so there are some really awesome SaaS options out there for adding uh, shopping cart and checkout functionality to sites in a way where it minimizes the compliance burden of the sites as well as provides that functionality without putting a lot of burden on Drupal, um, uh, where basically you can have people be adding products to a shopping cart, do the checkout. It's completely managed by a kind of like widgets that are interfacing with um, external persistent services. And I think that's one theme, actually, that's going to be really important in Drupal 8, is that similar sort of the Pi, like, like philosophy, like, the Internet's moving really quickly. There's a lot of really great services to do a lot of things on the Internet. 
Drupal is a really good hub to integrate those services together, but it doesn't have to do everything. And if you have a really great shopping cart that you can use, if you have a really great, you know, external slideshow thing, a really great, you know, login system, use those instead. Like the Drupal ones are good. If, if you like them, go for it. But it's not the end all be all. And having Drupal sit at the center of your sort of web experience is a really important and, and I think useful practice uh, to do that. And I think for stuff in Drupal 8 that you don't see modules for, look for other services you can integrate easily to do that same functionality, and you might be pleasantly surprised with what's possible. All right, next question uh, is, what is the current status of Redis for Drupal 8? So um, that's an interesting question mm -hmm. uh, because um, the, uh, we don't currently support it on Pantheon yet. Um, but the thing that's really interesting is that uh, I'm actually, I, I've, I mean, I haven't actually gotten these into Drupal cons yet, <laughs> but uh, I've been submitting presentations for a while on why I think that Redis should not Redis or Memcache should not necessarily be an assumed part of site builds uh, going forward. Uh, they are useful under certain circumstances, but uh, on systems like Pantheon, where uh, we're running modern relational databases like MariaDB 10.0 that have great um, threading support and event orientation support for their engine, and then we're running them on top of a lot of memory, SSDs, and really modern Linux kernels with modern storage engines, um, there's virtually no performance difference between talking to the database for key value store versus something like Redis. Uh, and really the value of something like Redis is only shining now if you're either saturating the bandwidth and you want to distribute out that workload, uh, or you are trying to offload uh, more complex data types uh, and operations like queues um, and locks, which um, actually most people who even use Redis don't offload those to Redis, uh, and Memcache can't offload those well compared to a database anyway. Uh, so I... I um, I didn't mention it as one of the reasons you might not want to build on Drupal 8 yet, because uh, I would seriously reconsider whether it's actually necessary. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> that's awesome. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd say to the extent to which you do want to check it out, like there is um, the Redis project on Drupal 8 has a sort of upgrade roadmap, Drupal node 2233413. Um, a lot of the work would, had been being done on, on GitHub. But I think one of the things you'll see with Drupal 8 is that not all the old practices you did for Drupal 7 are necessary, and that, you know, your mileage might vary in trying to figure out, you know, sort of what's, what's performant and what works as well. Um, and I think that's pretty important. So some of the biggest sites on Pantheon don't actually use Redis right now uh, on, with Drupal 7. Right. Next question is, since Matt is here, what's the status on Panopoly re D8? Oh, lovely. So Panopoly is a Drupal distribution of Drupal 7 that tries to sort of provide more out-of-the-box features for, uh, for Drupal. One of the things that really frustrated me and a lot of folks at Pantheon with respect to installing Drupal for the first time is that it didn't have a lot of these features you need to build a website, like views, like entity reference, like a WYSIWYG, like a better admin experience. And Panopoly was basically a distribution that built a lot of those features in Drupal 7. So if you turn on Drupal 7 with Panopoly, and look at a, and then turn on Drupal 8, there's actually a lot of overlap. That I sat down with um, David Snowpack, who's the co-maintainer and sort of lead maintainer now of Panopoly, and a lot of the features that we need to do to bring Panopoly up to Drupal 8 um, are already, already in Drupal 8. We don't need to support a new admin interface or a WYSIWYG because we already have them. The, um, the real sort of work on Panopoly for Drupal 8 is around panels for Drupal 8, which is uh, actually doing really well. Uh, David Snowpack, who is doing a lot of the work on that, along with Tim Plunkett from Acquia, to get Page Manager and Panels ready. And I would say if you're interested in Panopoly and uh, follow the Panels module, Page Manager work for Drupal 8, and as soon as those get into a, a pretty good state, we'll roll a version of Panopoly with the, some of the drag and drop and other technology as well. But it'll be a slimmed down version. A lot of what Panopoly did for Drupal 7 uh, is already in Drupal 8, and that's awesome. Alrighty, we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, we'll rush through these. The next one is, what are some of the D8 features that didn't make it in core that you would like to see in 8.1? Great, great. So we worked on Drupal 8 for four years. Uh, we got a ton of features in. We did not get every feature into Drupal 8. Um, I think, not to do too pie in the sky, but I think two, two things that I really thought would, be, would have been awesome in Drupal 8 and could be in Drupal 8.1. The first is, is really first-class media management. 
that media has always been sort of a tricky thing in Drupal, having the ability to store different kinds of, uh, of, of entities and having them work, you know, sort of external or internal, I think is really important. Second is having some concept of a layout system. Panels does this in Contrib, but I think there's a possibility in Drupal 8.1 to have a sort of full-on layout system that, that, that Core can use. That was previously called the Scotch Initiative in Drupal 8, but it didn't get all the way completed. I think building something like that, a panels and core kind of technology, would be really awesome. And I'd love to see that in 8.1. Alrighty, our next question is, what will change about live check? Uh, launch? Launch, launch check. check. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, great question. So there's a, a module we run on the Pantheon dashboard that you can also run on your own sites. It's called Site Audit on Drupal.org, Launch Check on Drupal uh, on Pantheon. And it's basically a set of static analysis for your Drupal site. So uh, one of the things that, that'll be pretty awesome is that um, some of the things it's checking for and other kinds of stack analysis checks for aren't as much of an issue. Some of the security stuff, the filters, some of the caching options, those are, those are done. But we'll, we'll roll out a launch check option for Drupal 8. It'll check the kind of stuff that we think is, is relevant to check and just try to provide good best practices. Um, the good thing, though, is that Drupal 8 has enforced a lot of the best practices by default now, um, like, for example, turning on page caching by default. And those are things that we will no longer, we can, we'll still check for, but you, it shouldn't be as much of an issue. All right, we have time for one more question. We're going to take, regarding multilingual, is the config experience and workflow more like entity translation or content translation? Sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, of course. Uh, the question was, in regards to multilingual, is the config experience and workflow more like entity translation or content translation? I believe it's more like entity translation. Uh, there was considerable work done uh, to have first class support for I18N in the configuration management layer. Uh, I'm not an expert on that work because it was largely um, done after we set in place the fundamentals of CMI in core, uh, but it is absolutely being shipped to the satisfaction of Gabor. Um, I chatted with him at DrupalCon, and he's very happy with um, the bridge that's been done between CMI and uh, uh, I-18N. Yeah, I think the other thing, if there's parts of the, you know, there, there's parts of the, the Drupal 8 system that you're curious about, like if you're really interested in Twig or multilingual or configuration management, I go on and search for Drupal Camp or DrupalCon sessions about these things. There's a full hour of multilingual stuff from DrupalCon LA, a full hour or several hours actually on Twig. And each of the different components of Drupal, Drupal 8 has a sort of presentation online about it. And so if you're looking to learn more, sort of that's a good place to go to dive into a specific kind of thing. There's been a lot of presentations on, on Drupal 8. Just watch the dates on stuff. Some stuff has changed over the years. But if you get stuff from DrupalCon LA forward, it typically will be pretty accurate and useful for, for everyone's work. Right, it looks like that's all we have time for today. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or feedback, please visit our website where you will find a contact us page and we'll put you in touch with the best member of our team. Have a great week, everyone. Bye, folks.